hopefully interesting though. Confusing in a cool way. Maybe. As cool as DIC can be. Uh, ah. Okay. Well, as long as the, the results are analyzable at the end, that's all that matters. Okay. So, uh, today we're going to keep talking about fracture mechanics. So, let's go through fracture. I'm recording this time. I'm, this time I don't have any demos though, so I just there as much. Uh, fracture mechanics. So, um, just a quick recap of some of the stuff we talked about at the uh, in last lecture. So, when you have a very thin crack, a, a sharp crack in a material, um, some sharp crack do, 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 <coughs> in a plate with a far field applied stress, some crack length now of 2A. Remember, we, we took our ellipse analysis and we said, all right, if we shrink this down to infinity, uh, if we shrink the radius down to be something infinitesimally small, theoretically we get an infinite stress concentration. Practically, that's not what happens, but we can get around that by just defining a general stress concentration factor. Uh, a K is equal to sigma infinity square root of pi A, where this is my far field applied stress. Um, and remember that I showed different fracture modes. So K1 was, was this sort of a, a fracture mode, a normal or an opening stress. There's also a shear mode and an out of plane, uh, an in plane shear mode and an out of plane shear mode, which are, um, you can think of like machining operations and like tearing a piece of paper respectively. Um, then we said uh, for, so, so K now is, is a geometric, geometric, parameter given the size basically of our crack A. Um, when a material fails, so with, with a given crack size in a material, there's some critical stress concentration factor, some Kc, or I'm going to call this a K1C, uh, and this is where our material fails, or uh, where the crack kind of propagates rapidly through the material. Uh, so failure, rapid crack propagation. And we said now this is a material property. So the stress concentration itself, the K1, is from geometry. The K1C, the critical stress concentration, is from, uh, is a material property. Uh, and then from that we know if, if, if we know what this fracture toughness is, um, relating it back to our, to our uh, stress, our K1 relationship, we can say failure will happen will happen when um, I have some critical stress, sigma C, uh, for a given internal crack size, K1C over square root of pi A. For <coughs> given A, or I can say, so this is now, if I know how big my biggest crack in the material is, if I know what my A is, um, I know how much stress I can apply to my thing before it fails. So to get this A, you can obtain it, obtain, uh, obtain using something like DIC, or not DIC, sorry, CT scans, so computed tomography using CT with x-rays, um, or something like ultrasound. And, and basically this determination of the maximum crack size in the material is when you hear the term <coughs> non-destructive evaluation, so non-destructive evaluation. So that's basically, from an engineering standpoint, engineers want to know when my material is going to fail without actually testing it. So 
I know when my material is going to fail if I pull on it and it fails at a certain stress. Cool. But then I ruined my part. And the next time I make a part, it may fail at a slightly different stress. And so this, not, this idea of non-destructive evaluation basically is trying to figure out what your microstructure it looks like, what the biggest flaws, what the biggest cracks, voids are, so you can figure out what this maximum working stress you can apply is. Um, so this is kind of a whole big field of, of applied engineering, is figuring out how big my cracks are so I can figure out how much force I can apply or how much load I can apply to it. Um, and it gets really complicated with stuff like composites for aerospace industries or for um, renewable energy for like wind turbines. So this this is kind of a, a tricky thing to get, but this is the general idea, is there's some material property. If we can figure out A, we can figure out what our critical stress is. Now, on the flip side, if I know what my working stress is, if I know how big uh, my sigma infinity is, I can write this instead as 1 over pi k i c over sigma infinity squared for a given sigma infinity. So this would be something like, for example, um, in a pressure vessel. So something where there's just kind of a constant hydrostatic working load, you know that um, it's going to be subjected to some pressure or to some stress based on how much pressure there is internally. And if I know, it, as, as I cycle that, I can see what size cracks there are inside and I can see how big those cracks are growing. And I know that once I hit a certain critical crack length, then it'll rupture, then it'll cause failure. And that's when you see pressure vessel explosions, um, which, oh, I should have pulled up an image of that. That would have been cool. Um, yeah, so there's, if you go on YouTube, there's some fun videos of them testing pressure vessels, where they'll take like giant train car size tankers, pressure vessels, and they'll just keep loading it up to high pressures until it ruptures. And that's how they do those tests, super neat. Um, anyway, so um, but it's all based on this idea that KIC is a, is a material property. So um, a couple minor notes in here. So now we can define uh, our, what do I want to do first? Do, do, do. Okay, so this relationship for K1 is a simplified relationship assuming that I have a small crack in a finite plate. Um, if this crack is a finite size relative to my geometry, technically for, for finite cracks, um, my K1 is, I can throw in a, a geometric parameter, some <coughs> lambda, sigma infinity, square root of pi A. Um, so from a practical standpoint, this now is a, is a geometric <coughs> metric factor that we're throwing in. Um, this can be, it, it depends on exactly <coughs> where your crack in your material is. So if I have some crack <coughs> in a plate of width 2w, crack length 2a, um, then I know if my a over w is equal to 0 0.1, for example, then my lambda is equal to something like 1.01. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. But if my a over w is equal to 0 0.6, then my lambda is something more considerable, 1.3. Um, but if instead I have something with a side crack, so something with a crack on the side here. Now my plate width is W. This length is A. Um, if my A over W is equal to 0 0.5, then this lambda is pretty considerable. So this can go up to like 2.8 something. Um, these are semi-empirically derived, um, but, and you don't, I, I'm not expecting you to necessarily know this exact formulation um, or memorize these numbers. This is more from an engineering standpoint so that you know this simplification is again for a tiny crack in a large plate 
And if we don't have a tiny crack in a large plate, there's this is how we account for it. We just kind of throw in a multiplier on top. Um, okay, so with all of that, we can define another useful parameter. We can define a factor of safety now for our materials. Factor of safety for our stuff. You remember the factor of safety, um, I'm going to call this x, uh, x, y for a normal yield for the, for the when we are looking at like our von Mises yield criteria. Um, this was the uh, yield strength over the, or the max strength over the yield strength. Max. Yes. Max over yield. No, yield over max. For some reason it was getting mixed up in my head. Yield. Yeah. And so long as this was greater than one we were fine. Ideally, we want it greater than like one and a half to to give it uh, to give us a safe working limit. Um, so this is for for ductile materials that are going to fail via yielding. Um, I can also define now uh, a fracture toughness or a fracture factor of safety. Xf is equal to my Kc over my K. Or I can throw in an I in here, um, KIC over KI, or KIC over sigma infinity square root I A. This is for brittle materials. So now I can think about this in terms of a, f a factor of safety in terms of a fracture toughness uh, given a far field applied stress and a, and a flaw size. I can also define this in terms of uh, maximum flaw size. So a factor of safety for, for how big of a crack I have. So some XA uh, is equal to my A critical uh, over over the A. This is for basically this this relationship for my A critical size, my maximum size. Um, which is then uh, one over pi <laughs> kice over sigma infinity squared over a. <coughs> this is also for brittle. Uh, just a slightly different way of kind of quantifying it, or kind of different way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so. I'm going to talk a little bit now. I'm going to try to gauge your kind of intuitive understanding of fracture toughness. So fracture, <laughs> in my opinion, is one of the harder ideas to get in, in solid mechanics. Um, it's just a little bit more abstract because it's not only, it's sort of a material and sort of a geometry thing and, and sort of depending on the loading state and there's different loading states that can all affect it and it's, it's kind of something that's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around sometimes, or at least it was for me when I was learning it. Um, so I wanted to gauge at least kind of your, your understanding of what fracture toughness means in a material. And then I'm going to go to another figure of merit for fracture toughness, which is uh, the critical energy release, so that G. But first, um, I'm going to go back to so I, I drawn a material plot yesterday. I'm going to redraw that, and we're going to kind of fill it out in a little bit more detail. So uh, if I'm looking at a certain material, I know it has some Young's modulus. Um, this is going to be in terms of gigapascals. I'm going to write it in terms of gigapascals. And there's some critical fracture toughness, or critical fracture uh, critical stress intensity factor. And this is going to be, again, these weird units of MPA root meters. Um, so for, these are sort of general numbers, um, but for something like a ductile, ductile steel, 
uh, our E is something on the order of 200 GPA for something like, say, 70, 75 aluminum. This is on the order of like 70 for our soda lime, lime glass. This is something on the order of 60 approximately um, for something like ABS, which is a plastic. This is on the order of like one GPA. Uh, and for something like natural rubber, <laughs> rubber, uh, this is very, very, uh, has a low stiffness, so 0 0.001. <coughs> so this is kind of decreasing Young's modulus. So this is basically how hard I have to pull to stretch the material, um, which should be at least somewhat easy to visualize or to understand. but. Fracture toughness is a little bit different. If you remember, it's uh, it's effectively how much force I have to apply to break the material for a given crack size. So I'm going to jump to whole everywhere stuff now. If it wants to work for me. Things are plugged in. Maybe my computer isn't going. Come on, you can do it. I believe in you. No, I don't. That's a lie. Ah, uh, goddamn it. Oh. Oh, cool. It worked. Okay. So, um, those materials, I'm just going to pick four of them. I'm going to pick four of them, the, the steel, aluminum, glass, and rubber. Which one is the toughest um, and which one is the least tough? So kind of order them in, in terms of decreasing toughness. Toughest one first, least tough one last. seconds to throw in your hands here. <coughs> okay, so this is good. So kind of a mix here of, of what exactly it should be, and that's understandable because, again, fracture toughness isn't as intuitive of a, of a, of a unit as something like stiffness. My GC, the thanks uh, for steel. Again, these are these are rough numbers, uh, and I'll show in a second an Ashley plot that shows everything <coughs> kind of plotted out. Uh, but steel is something on the order of twenty-five thousand joules per meter cubed. So that's how much energy it takes to tear this thing apart. And this is a fairly high, in general, ductile steels. Steel in general has has really high toughness and energy release, which is why engineers like using steels um, that and they're very cheap um, steel is like I don't know a factor of five cheaper than aluminum um, yeah it's because it's, it's everywhere uh, aluminum is something closer on the order of about 8,000 uh, soda lime glass if you remember this is this is around that one uh, which is that same uh, the number that, that Griffith had been using this is the surface energy 
um, of, of glass as it rips. Uh, ABS has kind of a range. Uh, it can be somewhere in the order of like 1,000 to 5,000. And then natural rubber is actually somewhere around 10,000. So um, in terms of order, it'd be steel, rubber, aluminum, glass, which uh, I think there actually was not that many people who had chosen that one. That was mine. <laughs> that was, that was the cool. Cool. <laughs> but so these are these are rough numbers. So, but this is kind of trying to give you. This is maybe a little bit more intuitive now. Um, fracture toughness, our K1C, is how much force you have to apply or how much stress you have to apply to break a given material. So it depends also on that that stiffness of the material. Um, whereas toughness, fracture. Uh, sorry, fracture energy at G uh, is how much energy you have to put in to, to tear something. Um, so if you had a, a sheet of natural rubber and you tried to cut it with scissors, it doesn't really cut very well. It's, it's actually really, it'll just deform around the scissors because it's, it's really, really tough. It's, it's difficult to tear. So this G intuitively makes, uh, maybe makes a little bit more sense. It's, it's tearability of your material, how easy is it, it is to break this apart. So we can look at this in terms of a material property plot. So these are, again, our, our Ashby plots are super useful. Um, there it goes. Cool. How do we do full screen? Whatever. I don't have to do full screen. So this Ashby plot is now, oh, why? There we go. How do I do? Uh, where's full screen on this guy? Sure. That works. Cool. Um, so this is an actual plot of modulus or stiffness versus fracture toughness. So up in the top right, we have our, our metals, which are both stiff and tough. Um, down here, these are our elastomers, our rubbers, which are not very stiff and not don't have a very high fracture toughness. Our technical ceramics, our glass, our, our aluminum oxide, um, they're technically tougher. They have a higher fracture toughness than the rubbers. But that GC, so this GC is equal to K1C squared over E, these dashed lines are constant K, uh, are constant GC lines. So you can see now a GC, this is kilojoules per meter, so this is 100,000 joules per meter. Um, here you have some steels and some nickel alloys are up in there. Um, leather is actually very tough, it's very difficult to tear, which is again why leather also is a is a desirable thing that people use to design stuff and make stuff um, and then our polymers our natural rubber uh, is something that's very has a very low stiffness but is still uh, has a low stiffness and a low fracture toughness but still has a high terability so has a high G so these two <coughs> concepts um, are ones that you should kind of try to nail down conceptually so and, and it may be difficult to intuitively get a hold of them, but um, yeah, this will hopefully kind of help start putting things in certain places in your mind. Uh, cool. So uh, this will be, this is posted to Canvas now, or will be posted with the next round of notes, I think. Um, cool, 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 cool. So now, Let's actually talk about the stress fields around these cracks. So uh, I gave you the relationship that, that K1 is, is sigma infinity squared pi A, but I, we don't actually know what the stress looks like around, around the crack tip to begin with, or, or mathematically what that should be. So it turns out you can use the same, the same general process we, you can use for finding the stress around a hole, uh, a circular hole in an infinite plate, that area stress function analysis. You can do the same analysis uh, or the same general process for finding the stress around a, a crack tip. So now this is uh, stress around uh, a crack, or the stress field around a crack. So the solution comes from the area stress function solution comes from Airy stress function 
which I don't expect you to know anything about. I just want you to know that I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. Technically, there's some mathematical derivation for it. Um, but now if I have a sharp crack, um, I'm going to define some coordinate system, some x and y uh, at some distance away from this thing now, some theta, uh, and some distance r. I have now a stress field that I'm interested in looking at. This will be my x, y, uh, and then there's some shears in here. Sigma x, y, um, and I can figure out what each of those are. So um, if I go through my, my stress analysis, I'm just going to give you the end result um, and kind of talk about what it means. The Um, so now my sigma x is something, uh, I'm going to have my k1, uh, so remember that k1 is our, uh, our sigma infinity, sigma infinity square root of <laughs> pi a. Um, this is now if I have a far, far field stress kind of going out away from the crack. Um, of sigma infinity. This is k1 square root <coughs> of 2 pi r uh, oops, cosine cosine of theta over 2 1 plus minus oof, 1 minus sine of theta over 2 sine of 3 theta over 2, then plus, uh, I'm going to say this is some higher order terms, higher order terms. So it turns out these, these higher order terms are something um, like some c1 r to the 1 half, c2 r to the r to the 3 halves, uh, so on, but because here we have a, a one over square root of r here in the root, so this is this is the important one. That one over square root of r, as it goes to zero, shoots up to infinity. So uh, my stress, Im the important thing to get out of this uh, is this is proportional to uh, one over square root of r. Um, but this is the general formulation. Uh, there's Similar ones for uh, for y and for theta. Uh, could write them down. I'll have them in the notes. You, I probably I'll just skip them for now. Um, but uh, basically, this this term, this one over r term, is the important thing because this goes to zero. This goes to infinity as r goes to zero, and all of these terms go to zero as r goes to zero. So we're really interested in the stress close to the crack tip. Uh, and so this is the only one term that we're really interested in. Um, and so that looks, uh, no, there we go. So if you remember the other day, I had shown <coughs> this YouTube video of DIC around a crack tip. Um, it wants to go. Nope, no, it doesn't want to go. Cool, 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 cool. Ah, there we go. So you may recognize this video from the other day, um, but as as I apply a stress around a sharp crack, you get some sort of funky stress field that looks something like that, um, and that comes from this analysis. So from this sigma x y z, I think uh, this is plotting oh, e y right. This is plotting the stress in the y direction, or the strain in the y direction. Oof. So we get some strain field like that. And that this is sort of what that strain field looks like experimentally. Um, but um, the important thing, again, to know is that theoretically this goes to infinity at zero. 
which again doesn't actually happen, but um, we'll talk about why that doesn't happen in a sec. Um, one important thing to note uh, is now whether we have a plane strain or a plane stress condition. So uh, the z, the sigma z, so so sigma y is something something some uh, one over r to the one one over uh, one over the square root of r some function of theta one over square root of r some function of theta um, sigma x y is also some one over square root of r times some function of theta uh, which I'll actually write these down in the notes um, but the z now depending on whether we have a thin sheet or a thick sheet is either zero or negative nu uh, sigma x x plus sigma y so this one is for a plane stress condition um, which is again a thin plate plate uh, and this is our plane strain draw some arrows which is our thick plate so um, this is important to think about because now when we have a plane stress versus a plane strain condition this this sigma z is going to cause basically an extra stress in my material that's going to cause failure to happen a little bit earlier so um, I had drawn I think the first day the the plastic <coughs> zone the plastic zone around uh, for the plane uh, I can spell things plane stress and for plane strain um, it turns out this actually even affects our our k1c so depending on whether it's plane stress or plane strain so the k um, k1c in terms of my g so this is either eg for for a plane stress uh, stress condition or square root of uh, of e g over 1 minus nu squared for plane strain so actually this the effect of this uh, through thickness stress the effect of the zz reduces your your k1c um, so this is a material property, but when we measure it, depending on the difference in stress state, um, it's going to basically affect this uh, this loading parameter in here. So um, experimentally, what people normally do for for when you're when you hear what the fracture toughness of a material is, it's almost always reporting this plane strain condition. So when you do a fracture test on a, on a given material, there's ASTM standards for exactly what shape your material should be, uh, how big the crack should be relative to the, to the size of the sample, how thick the piece of the plate should be, and that's all because they're trying to apply a state of plane strain. So plane strain uh, gives you basically, strain um, gives you a lower bound, bound on uh, K1C. So this is, they'll test things out in plane strain conditions because it'll it'll reduce the stress there. Um, and what happens experimentally, uh, screw it, let's just grab a new paper. Um, when you're looking at this, uh, a thin plate now, I'm going to try to draw this and I'm probably going to fail miserably. Uh, 
sure. If there's some crack here in your material, um, what can happen here around the tip of that crack is when it's thin, basically, because there's a, so this is our plain uh, stress condition, the, the part can actually neck in. It can, it can decrease thickness and fail that way. But when you have a thick plate instead, da, 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 let's draw something thick. Uh, something like this. plate, um, what you'll end up with is, uh, uh, so this one will, will start necking, and this one will actually have microvoid inside this area here. So, huh? Even if they're the same material. So this one, you'll actually start to get tiny little holes and gaps opening up around the crack tip because that plane strain isn't isn't letting it go in and it's getting stressed out. So you're actually you'll actually start to open up voids in your material. So um, that's it for, or I'll keep going through fracture on Tuesday. Uh, Monday we'll have a recitation for the DIC lab. Uh, grab all your stuff if you haven't already.